Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name's Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And I want to welcome you to The Vine, our online campus here at Wrightsville. Today, you're going to hear a fantastic message from Pastor Julia Hayes, who takes us back to that familiar story from John chapter 2, where Jesus turns the water into wine. And she gives us an amazing proclamation that's going to help us understand who Jesus is and how we can become more like him. So I hope you'll stay with us and worship uh, throughout our service today, because I think there's a message in there for all of us. Please join with me as we pray together the prayer on the screen. Gracious God, give to us the mind of Christ, who loved God and loved his neighbor, who healed the sick, fed the hungry, and prayed for the forgiveness of those who rejected him. May we follow his path in this life and the life to come. Amen.
Hello, Church. I'm Eun Soo Kang, one of the associate pastors here. Let us go before God in prayer. Holy and loving God, thank you for calling us into this place of worship. We come to you today with a heart full of gratitude, knowing that you are a God who delights in bringing joy into our lives. You take the ordinary moment and transform them into something better. Just as you bring light to our darkest days and hope to our hardest struggles. Lord, remind us that in the moment when we feel empty, you are always there, ready to fill us with your abundant love and grace. Even when things don't go as planned, your presence is with us, turning disappointment into joy and transforming our lives with your care. We know that you care deeply about the details of our lives. You see our needs, our longings, and our fears, and you, you meet us in those places with compassion and kindness. So today, we lift up those who are in need of your presence and healing touch. Especially, we pray for those whom we name with our voices or hold in our heart. Lord, hear our prayers. Help us, Lord, to trust in your timing and your provision. When we feel that we don't have enough, or when life takes an unexpected turn, remind us that you provide in ways we could never imagine. Teach us to see your hand at work in every season, filling our lives with meaning and joy. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to offer our hearts and gifts. As we respond to God's grace and generosity, you can contribute to the ministry of Ricefield United Methodist Church by mail and via website. Let us continue to worship God. Hello everyone, I'm Pastor in Seoul. How are you today? I'm so excited to share this time with y'all. Do you know what this is? Yes, this is the apron. Um, when do we usually wear aprons? Yes, people wear aprons when they are cooking, cleaning, or maybe serving food to others. Well, aprons protect our clothes um, from something dirty or some food or some dust. Today, I want to tell you about a time when Jesus did something special at a big celebration, a wedding. Well, actually, Jesus didn't wear an apron, but he used something even more amazing to help others. So at a wedding in the Bible, something went wrong. They ran out of drinks for all the guests. Can you imagine going to a party but suddenly there is nothing left of drinks? That would be like going to a party, birthday party, but there is no cake. People were worried, but Jesus knew what he did do. So even though it was not his job and no one expected for him to help others, Jesus just stepped in and he worked a miracle to make sure there was enough drink for everyone. 
And you know what? What he gave them was not just regular. It was the best. Jesus helped out because he loved people and wanted them to have joy at the, the celebration moment. Just like I would wear this apron if I was um, helping in the kitchen, Jesus used his helping hands at the wedding to make things better. Jesus shows us when we help others, we share God's love with others. So let us remember today's lesson and let us help others to share love and kindness. Let us pray together. Dear God, thank you for your love and thank you for your help. Help us to help others and love others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my great joy to get to bring you our scripture passage and message today. We're in the midst of a sermon series called Be Like Jesus, where we are exploring the ways that Jesus interacted with people and wondering how we can follow Jesus in those same sort of patterns. Today, we have a really fun passage, which comes to us from the Gospel according to John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Hear now this word. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we, your people, are longing today to hear from you. God, I pray that in this time you would use even me to speak a word to your people. Lord, if there's anything that I say now that is not from you, please let it be instantly forgotten. But God, if there's anything that I say that is from you, Please let it sink and root deeply into our hearts. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Anyone who has ever had a wedding knows that there are certain parts of your wedding day that you will remember forever. Most of those are the significant moments, hopefully with your new spouse. But for me, one of my primary memories from my wedding day happened even before the ceremony. I had been with my photographer outside the building, taking portraits of just me before the ceremony. Now the time had come when the guests were beginning to arrive, the time when I would go and sit with my bridesmaids and get ready to walk down the aisle. I opened the door to the room where we were all getting ready, and I will never forget what I saw one of my bridesmaids standing on a table while my sisters crouched underneath her, stapling the hem of her dress. Evidently, there had been an alterations crisis that everyone but me had known about. And for the past 12 hours, the bridesmaids had been working together to solve a problem that I did not even know that we had. Because everyone knows the cardinal rule of a wedding day 
if there is a problem, you do not tell the bride. Apparently, that was the case even 2,000 years ago in Israel. In our passage today, Jesus finds himself in the middle of a bride's worst nightmare. The story takes place really early on in the gospel according to John. Jesus had just appeared on the scene. He has been baptized by his cousin John and called his first disciples to come and follow him. So far though, Jesus has not performed any miracles publicly. He hasn't healed anyone, hasn't clashed with any of the religious authorities, or even provided any spiritual teachings that we have a record of. When Jesus attends this wedding, along with his newly minted disciples and his mother, he doesn't do so as a public figure, probably just as a friend of the family that's getting married. Now, we might think that expensive and lavish weddings are a recent phenomenon, but if a simple low-key wedding is what you're hoping for, the practices of Jesus's day are going to disappoint you. A Jewish wedding at the time of Jesus was a party that lasted seven days. Yes, you heard that right, one whole week. Now, I was overwhelmed enough planning one single dinner for my guests. Can you imagine needing to provide celebratory food and drinks for seven whole days? So much could go wrong. And apparently that day in Cana, so much did go wrong. The wedding was not anywhere close to over, but the hosts had run out of wine. Mary, Jesus's mother, somehow finds out about this. And it seems that Mary has just enough of a panache for meddling to try to solve the problem. I can just picture her finding her son, gently tapping him on the shoulder to get his attention away from his buddies and saying, Psst, Jesus, the wine, it's all gone. Do something. Jesus responds, what concern is that to you and me? After all, this is fundamentally a catering crisis. Jesus's hesitation to address the problem of wine running out isn't necessarily because he doesn't think it matters. Instead, he says, my time has not yet come. In other words, Jesus's hesitation isn't because the miracle would be unrelated to his ministry, but actually because it's so indicative of his mission that if he does it, then he is officially out on the scene. There's no more hiding who he is after this. And Jesus knows that to begin doing miracles is also to begin his road to the cross. At the end of the passage, John tells us that the miracle was the first of Jesus's signs that reveal his glory. What is it about this particular act that reveals Jesus's glory? How is this a sign of who Jesus is? Well, today we're going to explore three things that are revealed about Jesus's character in this passage. And since we're learning how to be like Jesus, we'll also explore how we can embody those characteristics in our own lives. First, this miracle reveals that Jesus's compassion is far more expansive than we ever imagined. Everyone's different when it comes to planning a wedding. Well, when it came time for me to plan my wedding, I was the kind of person who had actually been planning for years, probably since I was about six years old. Now, although I did manage to exercise enough self-control to not buy a wedding planning magazine at the grocery store until Matt proposed, the Pinterest board had been up and running for years. Centerpieces, bouquets, dresses, place cards, dance floors, you name it, I had thought about it and had an opinion on what would be best. I had so much fun planning our wedding. And yet, as I considered all of the details, and let's be honest, sometimes stressed out about all of those details, I kept feeling the shame creep up in me. The little shame gremlins in my head kept whispering things like, how could you care about place cards when so many people have actual problems? 
or it is so shallow that you care this much about flowers. In the midst of all of this, I experienced the tenderness of Jesus pointing me towards this passage and reminding me of how he responded when faced with these sort of wedding details. He didn't say, why would I care about this when there are millions of people actually suffering in the world? He didn't say this party has gone on long enough and this is the sign that we should all head home. He didn't say people worried about food and drink aren't fit for the kingdom of God. Instead, Jesus interfered in a party planning emergency out of love. Running out of wine would have been humiliating. It would have made the steward, picture the first century's version of a wedding planner, look bad because he had failed to regulate the distribution of wine so that it would last for everyone for seven days. But even more, it would be humiliating for the family. It would be like if you invited all of your friends out to a fancy dinner only to have your card declined at the end for insufficient funds. Jesus is moved to compassion for the family, the steward and the servants. He gets that running out of wine at a wedding isn't a matter of life and death, but he still decides to help. Jesus looks at the people involved and said, this matters to you and you matter to me. Jesus says the same thing to us today when we're facing a struggle, whether it's big or small. When you're hurting, Jesus says to you, this matters to you and you matter to me. Now, this isn't a promise that Jesus will supernaturally interfere to solve all of our problems, but I think it does mean that Jesus looks on us with compassion when we're worried about something, whether or not that something has eternal significance. If we want to be like Jesus, we need to practice this kind of compassion we need to practice caring about the things that other people care about, even if it's only because we care about them. This might be especially relevant for us in the midst of a very tense election season. I don't know about you, but often I will see someone post something online about a problem that they see in society that they believe that their candidate can fix. And I often find myself rolling my eyes and thinking, oh, come on, that doesn't matter. This other thing matters a whole lot more. Do you ever find yourself doing that? Well, what if we practiced compassion by pausing and thinking, this matters to you and you matter to me? Could we try to imagine why that thing might matter so much to the person who posted it? And even better, what if we started conversations with people that we know we disagree with like that? I see that XYZ is really important to you. Will you tell me about it? This miracle reveals that Jesus' compassion is more expansive than we imagined. And we can be like Jesus by practicing compassion. This miracle also reveals that Jesus brings abundant life. In the Hebrew scriptures, wine was a symbol of joy, abundance, hope in the future. Unlike many crops, growing grapes for wine wouldn't make a profit immediately. It took several years before the vines would produce enough grapes to start manufacturing wine. And even then, the fermentation process takes time. You only plant a vineyard and produce wine if times are good. That's why in the Old Testament, vineyards are used as an image of the promised kingdom brought about by the Messiah. By transforming water into wine, Jesus reveals himself as the long-awaited Messiah. Not only does Jesus provide wine, but he provides a truly bonkers amount of wine. The servants fill up six stone jars that each hold between 20 and 30 gallons. That means that Jesus produces between 120 and 180 gallons of wine. For context, that is the equivalent of about 900 bottles. I was curious how much wine is usually needed for a wedding today. The Knot, which is a popular wedding planning website, 
recommends that for a 200 person reception lasting five hours, you would want to have 200 bottles of wine on hand. Jesus provided more than four times that amount. And apparently the wine was really good stuff. Good enough that the steward who didn't even realize that the wine had been produced by Jesus asked where this had been the whole time. He pulls the groom aside and says, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you've kept the good wine until now. In John 10, 10, Jesus describes his ministry this way. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. In his first miracle, Jesus embodies this mission statement. Jesus' dream for us is abundant life, not just survival, but full, joy-filled life. In John 1.16, we're told that from Jesus' fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Through Jesus, we are filled to the brim and overflowing. So how can we embody this abundant life that Jesus gives? Well, we can be free with our blessings to others because we know that we already have more than enough. We are no longer living in fear fear that we won't be enough, fear that God won't accept us, fear that we won't be recognized. In Jesus, we already have more than enough. And from that abundance, we are free to throw blessings around like confetti. Jesus' first miracle reveals that he's compassionate, that he brings abundant life. And finally, this miracle reveals that Jesus isn't interested in recognition. When Jesus turns 180 gallons of water into fine wine, he reveals who he is. But he doesn't reveal it to everyone. The majority of the guests don't know that Jesus solved a problem. They don't even know that there was a problem. The couple doesn't know what Jesus did for them, although they might be curious why their wine is suddenly so much better. And even the steward, who was saved from what could have been a career-ending faux pas, doesn't know that it was Jesus who rescued him. When Jesus performs this first sign that reveals his glory, his only witnesses are the wait staff. The servants, whose job it is to disappear into the background, get VIP access to the work of God. They get to see the moment when, as one medieval theologian put it, the water recognized its creator and blushed. Jesus's miracle is only seen by the ones who are themselves unseen. Because Jesus doesn't come to be praised by the powerful, but to manifest his power among the weak. Jesus doesn't work for the recognition of others, And he teaches us not to either. He tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, when you give, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be done in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. To be like Jesus, our good work should happen in secret. Growing up when I was having a bad day or I was being super grumpy, my mom would give me the following assignment. Do something good for someone else and don't get caught. She herself practices this. For example, sometimes she will go on a walk and find litter that she can throw away. But if someone sees her pick pick it up and put it in the trash, then it doesn't count. She has to do it again and not get caught. How could you bless someone and not get caught? This first miracle reveals so much about Jesus' character. We learn that Jesus' compassion is more expansive than we imagine, that Jesus brings abundant life, and that Jesus isn't looking for recognition. Now that Jesus has been revealed to us, let's go live in a way that reveals Jesus to the world. Would you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we thank you for the story of this, your first miracle in Cana. 
God, we thank you for all of the surprising ways that Jesus acts in the world. Jesus, would you help us to be more like you, more willing to show compassion, more willing to share abundant life, and more willing to serve without any desire to be recognized. Help us to be like you. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go from this time now to be like Jesus in the world. And as you go, may the spirit of the living God made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord go before you to show you the way. Go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own. Go above you to watch over you and protect you. Go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand. Go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace. <laughs>